So good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending another educational webinar uh, hosted by the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain. Today's webinar is Vertical Dimension and Our Fear of Heights with Dr. Kevin Mueller. Attendees are encouraged to submit questions using the chat box located to the right of the screen, and questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation uh, by myself as the moderator and with Dr. Mueller uh, answering the questions. So, Registrants can expect to receive an email with, from the recording of this presentation within two to three business days. Uh, looks like we have uh, Egypt on the line too, and another one, someone from Marquette, Michigan. So we got a great, great attendee audience here today. So if you're interested in some more learning opportunities, uh, don't forget to sign up for live webinars at aacfp.org. Uh, you can also look forward to webinar recordings on our YouTube channel and keep up with the latest news in the field by following us on Facebook and Twitter. And I'd like, I'm happy to announce, uh, you know, that you guys are able to join us for the AACP Global Summit on Clinical Care and Adapting Communities to be held live August 7th through 8th. So earn over 15 CE credits from our expert faculty, such as Dr. Anthony Simmons, Chris Simmons, uh, Eric, Fel Eric Phelps, uh, Peter Catal Catalano, Sasha Gomenak, and as they present some of the latest science in oro and cranial facial healthcare, in addition to timely topics stemming from the aftermath of COVID-19. So register today at aacfp.org slash 2020 meeting, which I will post in the, in the chat, and I will also direct you guys to that at the end of the webinar. So, and that brings us to our feature presenter for today, so Dr. Mueller, uh, we are lucky to have him on with us. Uh, he attended dental school in Southern Illinois, where he also completed his GPR. Uh, he then moved to Phoenix, Arizona, uh, where he began his private practice in 1981. He has taught at Midwestern Dental School for 12 years and is an uh, associate faculty member there. In recent years, uh, he's been extremely involved with AACP and is currently on the board. Additionally, he has completed TM and sleep residency with TNS International, which is with our Dr. Olmos, and has a part-time practice treating craniofacial pain along with a busy restorative practice. So Dr. Mueller? Yes. I'll pass it off to you, sir. Get my screen share here. And with the, which one do we- We have? just gotta minimize that yellow top left. All right. And then, Yep, we are good to go from here. All right, guys, good evening, good morning, wherever we are. Um, it's kind of fun to do this. I've done this presentation before. I've added some new stuff today. Um, uh, we're gonna talk about a vertical dimension. It seems to be a hot topic out there, especially when it comes to phase two um, uh, restorative work after you do TM work. Um, of course, I'm a member of the AACP. I think uh, it's a wonderful organization and, and uh, I wouldn't be where I am today without this organization. So I wanna say special thanks to uh, many mentors uh, that I've had over the years and starts with uh, God bless Pete Dawson. Uh, that's where my career started down in Florida, Frank Spear, David Hornbrook. And those gentlemen got me off, um, on my, off my feet in regard to restorative dentistry. And then Bob Walker and Jim Carlson, I can't say enough about. and. Special thanks to Steve Almos. He's, he's uh, I think, uh, filled in the, the gaps from uh, what didn't make sense to me and all those other gentlemen. And uh, it's made me a very whole doctor, I believe. So uh, tonight I wanna, I wanna go through um, and talk about vertical mention but, and, and redefine some new terms and just where am I thinking now? I'm not here to tell anybody what to do. I think there's probably some people listening that are very good clinicians and better at some of this stuff than I am, but it's just where I'm thinking now today. Here we are 40 years later in my career. And, uh, and I see a lot of worn dentition courses and I see this is one of my uh, cases, it's actually a failure. And so this patient obviously has an insufficiency of porcelain, right? And um, of course they want veneers, they want uh, cosmetic work done. And of course I fulfilled that need back in the day. and. Unfortunately, I uh, did it the best of my ability, but here we are a decade later and we got a functional failure. And, uh, and when I first saw that, I didn't really know why. Um, I, I should say, 
when I go back, what I know today in 2015, 2020, I know why. Uh, so tonight I kind of want to lay out a little different sequence of what I look at now when I'm going to raise vertical or change mandibular position. And so here's the same laboratory, same uh, ceramic system, same articulator system, same doctor that did the work, and it's very functional today, just like it was when we placed it in the early 2000s. And so what's the difference? And I believe we're gonna get to the bottom of that tonight. So let me, let me just qualify a term. I, I really do not like the word vert vertical dimension. I think that's a tooth position. Um, vertical dimension, we need a dentition to be the best mandibular position. So if we're gonna use a term, let's use mandibular position. We must provide the best functional occlusion, muscle position, TM joint position, and then finish with the best tooth position and support the, everything above. And I think that's the difference of my thinking now versus 15, 20 years ago. This is the best chance to achieve long-term stability. Um, so uh, love them to death, but when I was taught all everything about teeth, all I did was focus on teeth. Thank you, Dr. Almos. He's got me quit not looking at teeth first. and. And so if we approach it in these three uh, points, the TM joints, the airway, and functional breathing issues, and dental occlusal teeth issues last, I think we're going to be serving our clients better in the future. Um, as far as when we talk about bite records, again, let's just call that mandibular position, or at least if we say bite records, let's think mandibular position. And, and that has to do with muscular uh, position. It has to do with neurological these teeth have to chew, swallow, speak, and breathe. For gosh sakes, it's a neurological result that we're after. And of course, the condylar position is going to affect all that. And so the, the intercuspal position, which we tend to, as dentists, look at first, has got to be congruent with all those things physiologically. So if anybody wanted a cookbook tonight, you ain't going to get it here. Um, this is really a thinking sport. It's a combination of science and art. And um, I, I honestly don't think I build the same case the same way each time. Um, so the question is, where do you start? And hopefully you're not digging the wrong direction. So um, the things that we have to think about when we talk about mandibular position and vertical opening is, is do you need restorative room? And almost all these wear cases, the answer is yes. Does it make it easier? At this point of my career right now, I believe that opening vertical and changing mandibular position makes the case easier. If uh, I don't know if you guys have tough bridge work you gotta do and you gotta live with the occlusion that the, on the other side that the patient doesn't wanna change. Man, those are tough cases and they all often end in failure. The condyle position, and it doesn't matter whether you're a CR guy or a neuromuscular guy, um, you have to decide is the position the correct position, or do you want to change it, or do we? Or can you live with it? And that's up to each individual practitioner. Overjet and overbite limitations is, always comes into play. The more you open the vertical, guess what? You know your your mandible drops back. It, do, it doesn't a operate like a piston. It falls back, and you you can end up with very thick porcelain uh, linguals of uppers and long teeth. So there's there's a fine line between how much do you open and how much do you not. And then, of course, when you got the worn short teeth, you got to solve the aesthetic problems. It doesn't do any good to solve all these other issues that the patient doesn't like the aesthetics when you're all done. So as you'll see here in a few moments, I, I start with aesthetics. And then, obviously, airway considerations. And then here's a biggie, pre, during, and post-treatment. So if you could be changing things that last for weeks and months and temporaries, how do you handle those airways? You know, are you gonna use CPAP? Are you gonna use appliances? What, what are you gonna do? And you gotta th you know, think that as part of the treatment plan. Um, so our clinical options are, can we open vertical and, and mandibular position change with restorative only? A lot of times that's true. Sometimes I've done restorative where I've done the anterior teeth and had an orthodontist uh, bring the uh, posterior uh, occlusion into play. And sometimes I've had orthodontics first and done the restorative, which makes sometimes the aesthetics easier up front. And then there's cases where it's just strictly orthodontics only. And the patients get to decide. Um, my experience is, is most of the patients is, uh, want as much restorative done possible and as little uh, orthodontics as possible. But uh, uh, that's up to each individual. Um, 
Thank you, Dr. Dawson, for this slide out of your book. But it, uh, this is probably the, the crux of the whole thing. We got muscle function. We got a condyle position uh, up in here. And we have the teeth intercuspation. And we want the right occlusal forces on the long axis of the teeth. So that's our ultimate goal right there. So it really comes down to the million dollar question. How, how much can we open or should we even open? And that's a clinical decision. Um, CEJ to CEJ, I don't believe there's a magical number. I think it's somewhere between 15 and 20. It seems like my cases always end up in there. Um, that's personal uh, um, opinion on how much overbite over jet that you want in your anterior cases. Um, commonly taught out there for many, many years, especially at the Dawson Institute and Pankey is a first point of contact as a reference. So essentially what you do is you seat the condyle and wherever that first point of contact, usually in a, in a molar or sometimes a bicuspid, um, the anterior teeth don't touch. And so that reference position of the first point of contact is, is uh, what's chosen as a starting point. Um, overbite, overjet, incisors too long and thick, we talked about that, aesthetic and phonetics. You're going to have to try these th things out in temps for a long time. So if you're going to get into these cases where you're changing vertical and doing phase two, uh, you're going to need uh, good temporaries that last for a period of time so you can test out your phonetics and, and your occlusion and your, and your muscles. Um, condylar reposition, a lot, a lot of our appliances today are, are pull forward or, or uh, um, uh, appliances that change the mandibular position, and you're going to need an appliance for two, three months to try this out and try and wean them off of it. So um, here's, a, here's a slide from Dawson on, on regard to that CRO interference, where if you find that first point of contact, um, you, for every one millimeter in the back, you're going, to you're going to gain two to three millimeters in the front. Now, I did this for a lot of years. This is, this is the, what's still taught out there quite a bit. And as long as you have a healthy joint and that's the proper position, that's the right mandibular plane and the right mandibular position, I have no problem with this. The challenge in, um, that you have in that is, is, is that condo on the right position? So here's a case, not great photography, it's an old slide, but you know this is a CO worn, really worn in case. And then you put the patient seat the condyle in the first point of contact, which, which in this particular case is way back in the second molar, and that would be called centric relation at that point. Now, the theory is, is you got a lot of room in the front here that you can now add material to or, or restore, or you could open the vertical from that point of contact. That's a clinical decision of what you want to achieve with your wax up and uh, what you want to end up with the case. What I'm saying is I don't do this as much anymore because invariably, when you have teeth worn like this, you've got condylar problems, you've got position problems, you've got, you've got uh, cant problems in the jaw. So these are the things tonight. I just want to have a couple cases to go through. And I think there's things before you take this position to do this, maybe think about some of these other things tonight. And then, so my, my job I see tonight is just make some, some awareness. And and because this is what happens, this this young girl comes in and she looks like the occlusion's great, uh, all the function looks fine, and guess what? You take a CBCT and you got distalized condyles. These things are melting away. Obviously, we also got to look at some uh, metabolic problems with this person and and some uh, systemic issues. It could be a possibility here, but. You know, what I want to make, if, them, if they came in with a, uh, any jaw pain, would I want to make a centric relation appliance for this patient? The answer is no. So I just, I just say a word of caution because this, this patient just came in recently. Um, so we know now, and we've known for years, that we need this condyle on forward. We need space behind for the retrodiscal tissue for the blood supply and the, uh, supply and the neurology. So... This is pretty much old hats and old slide, but this bone up in here uh, on, the, on the temporal bone is where you want the force going, the thinnest part of this disc over the condyle. In the posterior, we want posterior space so, the, so they can have the proper blood supply and neurology. And so these days for me are kind of gone. Matter of fact, this patient's laying down in the chair. I just don't do this anymore because that's more of a no matter, even if you uh, use light force, it's, uh, it's kind of shoving back the mandible and it's distalizing a lot of time. So uh, I don't think that's where I want to be with these complex restorative cases. So this is what we've all been taught. 
So a little history lesson. Uh, so here's that first point of contact when you mount. You got a wear case. Seat the condyle way up in here, and guess what? You got a first point of contact here. So now, how are we going to build front teeth there? So what we've been shown is we grind down the back teeth to make everything fit. So the problem is, once you grind that off, how do you put that back if that doesn't work? So that's why you do it on a model and do what they call a trial equilibration. I understand that. But, you know, even then, you're fighting for space in the front for the wax up. Have I done cases like that? Many, many, many I have. And you, and you still fight for space sometimes. So uh, what I like to do now, this is a, it's an older case where a patient come in and, and it's, not a, it's not a joint pain patient, but I'm looking at, hey, I gotta wanna lengthen some teeth. We wanna preserve these teeth. This patient is in my practice still with 28 uh, rest restorations now. But it was in a time in his life that he didn't have any money and he wanted me just to temporize some things. So I looked at his repose position and he didn't show much. And, and, and so I worked on his F point here, composite, let him say 55 for phonetics. I think anytime that you can build teeth with a proper phonetics, you're going to get pretty close to the functional uh, position of those teeth. So Here's just a little encouragement. Use composite sometimes. You can, if you're artistic and you like doing this stuff, I mean, I had a ball just, just bonding that. This person ended up restoring the posterior teeth. I did such a nice job on the, on the maxillary anteriors and buys that uh, he, he did all the lower posteriors and then the upper posteriors, and then we ended up just finishing with the front. So it's not necessarily the sequence I like doing, but that's the way it worked out for him. And then John here, I showed you his uh, earlier. John's been in the mouth 15 years. It looks like the day I put it in. This is the same lab as the other case that failed. So uh, aesthetics has to drive the cases. Uh, the lower incisors of John was about eight and a half. Uh, the upper incisors was about 11, 11 and a half. And then you get a CEJ 15, 16. I probably wouldn't have that much overbite today. I think some of this has erupted a little since the case was completed, but it's been done over a decade. So calculations of, of space and what you want to achieve and what you want to have aesthetically is, is very important in these cases. Um, when I do my bite records, I always use cold laser to reduce the inflammation as I to, do my records. Um, this is the MLS laser, which is fabulous. You can do all kinds of things. You can do aqualizer. You can do a TENS here for 30, 60 minutes. Um, I, I don't take my bite records. This is a two TENS one. And, uh, you know, half an hour with this is, is a really good deprogrammer. But um, I don't use the TENS for my bites. And I know some people that do. And, and I, I think every clinician has to find their sweet spot. So historically, I've used a lot of bite record anterior stops because the most important thing is, is we got to have a diagnostic workup and how do we standardize this? So, you know, there's a leaf gauge and Lucia, panky jig, composite, green stick compound. There's all kinds of things that you can do an anterior stop. What we don't want is teeth touching during a bite record because then the bite record material is too thin and you won't get an accurate record. So Lois has volunteered her uh, body to science here and uh, she's come in and she wants some posterior restorations and she's not feeling she's hitting on the left side and she's got a little uh, um, soreness in her left joint. So I use composite ball. So you just take a little flowable, you don't use bonding agent, you just put flowable in the interproximal at the midline there and, and cure that and make a little bump. So if you make it too high or too low, what I'm, all I'm trying to do is have enough separation in the back teeth and a light touch behind the central so that, that it has a stop. And I want a point stop. So I do this with articulating paper and then I equilibrate it with a burr. And so you end up with just a little point right here just for a stop. And then you take your bite record. So when you mount this, you're going to have to compensate for the thickness of the bite record. And I think everybody's pretty familiar with that, uh, opening the pin for the, on the articulator. So um, you can also use uh, Lucia Jig or uh, Panky uh, deprogrammers. I use, one, when I do deprogram, I want this thing flat. So I use a thing called a whale tail. I think you can get that from Great Lakes. And uh, I don't, I used to use this for a bite, but you can see the thickness is just way too much for a bite record. 
So even if you take out the whale tail, uh, this jig hitting on the front, I don't want that much open because it's, it's too hard to estimate how much of the pin you have to alter when you mount the case. Um, leaf gauges are really popular out here for, for uh, taking uh, mandibular bite records. Um, uh, I've not, not been a fan of it. I know a lot of people that are that swear by them and, you know, God, God bless them. Um, one of the reasons why what you do is you, you put the material on and then you have the patient slide forward with a mandible and then back and squeeze. So it's a, it's a pretty loaded bite, which is fine. But uh, what I don't care for sometimes I always worry about is, am I going to distalize this mandible with this technique here? And I'm not saying I do, and the, the people that love this say they don't. So, you know, I just don't know. So to me, it's, it's, I, I have better and simpler ways to get around that. So the bite I'm going to talk about the most tonight is the phonetic bite or the sibilant phenome. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, go Google sibilant phenome. There's quite a bit on it. Uh, it's the only bite in the literature that three-dimensionally opens the airway. It reduces pharyngeal collapse and um, it's, it's a uh, position of new, uh, neural neutrality. So um, what I like about it, it gives a really, really good uh, relationship between the maxillary and mandibular arches. And a lot of time, too, it corrects cants. It sometimes even corrects midlines. And um, it, it always amazes me how the brain, when you say the letter uh, or count, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, the brain knows how to put the mandible in the right position. And that's what I try to follow. So I try to, to get that bite record and then mount that. So S is the word, and, and our let S be your guide is kind of the key term. Now, this is interesting. Earl Pound, I remember him when I was studying in dental school in the 70s, and I think I believe he's passed by now, but this is 1977. So isn't it amazing that the same stuff that we're talking about doing appliances was the same things that stabilized dentures? You got to remember in the 70s when I started my training, the average 65-year-old in, in America only had six teeth in their mouth. So dentures was the big deal. It was the standard of care. Um, this bite record also corrects lateral cants. And uh, so oftentimes when you see a bite record, it's uh, when you do a phonetic bite, you see a small space on the left side and a big space on the right side. And it's very common how, how the body uh, adapts. So here's the literature. Uh, Dr. Almost, Dr. David Singh uh, published this a while back. And so you can Google that article and, and read all about it. But it, it's, it's published and it's a very, very valid study. So here's the phonetic bite. Now right here, this is Lois again. And this is a, a stick that I used for composite, re uh, for the uh, unfilled resin. So this is really skinny right here. So this, when she says 66 right here, I'm capturing that uh, relationship between the upper and lower teeth. And then I'm putting bite record material here. Now, as you hold the stick and do this, guys, don't get cheap with your dental materials. Uh, let this set up, continue holding the stick, and then come over here and get another tip and then and then inject the blue mousse over here or whatever material you want, futar D, whatever you like. And um, interesting, I wish I had a picture because this was very narrow in here and this has a lot of space back here, which is really interesting. And so uh, I also use a lot of face bows. We're gonna talk about when to use face bows and when not to, or when you don't need to. Um, most of the face bows that are designed, a lot of them in Germany are all Frankfurt horizontal plane face bows. I use campers plane. If you notice this line right here from uh, on campers plane, it's the same parallel as the occlusal plane to, to the back half of the skull. So I tend to want to want that face bow relationship. Uh, very commonly you'll see in our patients, especially our pain patients, where you see a lot of some cranial distortions. You, you, you've all seen that when you put on their face bow, you got one eye higher or one eye lower and and these planes don't light up. So we want the occlusal plane uh, with the maxilla, with the eyes, with the ears, everything to be uh, level. If, if not, then these are usually tougher cases. There, there's a lot of things called AP, AP strains and, 
and something that has a lot to do with migraines, things like that. So here's Lois again. I'm doing a couple examples of different face bows. I, I have Sam and uh, Stratus in my office. So this is a, a Sam face bow. Um, you notice it's Frankfurt horizontal on her. And then this is Sam with the campers. Now, if you can see it, I probably needed to drop it just a little more down here to the, to the Alatragus line. And then what I do like about the Sam face bow when you're trying to mount, I like this second bar because this, you know, you are looking for cranial distortions. And so the eyes go through here and then, then you have campers plane. And so this is a nice face bow, but you'll see in a minute why it's not, I don't use it as much anymore. Uh, my new face bow is the Stratus face bow. I, I, I love this one. Um, it doesn't have that bar. I wish it did across, but that's okay. Um, here's Stratus again, and we're using Camper's Plane from the Alatragus line right through there. And then, of course, these, you just tighten these up, and they're, they're very nice to mount, mount your case. So... Lois, we use the CR mounted composite ball. So we're gonna compare CR to phonetic tonight. And so here's her mounting in CR. And so she's got pretty good intercuspations on the right side. She's, this side will not hold shim stock in the mouth. So she's, her complaint of not having occlusion on that side is, is valid. And with a little articulating paper, you can see on the right side, she's much heavier and doesn't doesn't show much over here. This is artifact right here, so she pulls through shim stock there. So there's their upper model. Interesting when you look at uh, models, how this one flares this way and this one's a little straighter on this side. So let's let's do a CBCT on that on that MIP or that CR bite here, and you can see Lois's. These condyles are very distalized. Now, she, a little history, she's had two or three orthodontic treatments in her lifetime. And um, now she wants me to do restorative. So I look at that and I go, I know this is a vertical dimension lecture, but uh, would I want to build this vertical or any occlusion to this condyle position? And probably not. Here's a closer look of the left side, and her condyle is almost in her ear hole. So, um, I don't treat x-rays. I've seen joints like that that never had any pain that maybe you leave alone and you just, you just inform the patients. But um, when somebody wants a lot of dentistry, then you, it raises a red flag. So just looking at her MIP here and airway, she, her minimum airway here is 61 millimeters squared. So she's, she's pretty tight in here. So 100, 150 is usually the minimum we're looking for. Um, so this is, this is a little red flag also. Um, we also look with the CBC teeth, look through the nose, look for any inflammations and swellings, things like that. So it's, uh, in her case, she's got a little na nasal valve compromise. And so, you know, literally Lois is walking around with a clothespin on her nose most of her life. So... Um, the other way with a face bow, we also have MIP in size of papilla uh, mounting. So we use the inside of the papilla and the hamular notches right in here. And what I like about the new Ivoclair uh, HIP plane mounting jig is it goes right on the articulator. So you're going to see a case here at the end where I actually use the, uh, the AccuLiner and then I had to transfer it to this Ivoclair articulator. But this one here actually sits right on the articulator, so I don't have to change instruments. So here's the bar there at the hamular notches, and here's the point where they incise the papilla. So you can mount it right on this articulator. So there's Lois's case right there on it. Here's the bar here at the, at the hamular notches, size of papilla. And then here's the lab monkey back there doing the job. So uh, it's really easy to mount with this. And then there's your upper model. Um, I, I think that either one, if you end up getting a Stratus, the 100 or 200 are fine articulators. Either one work just, just fine. Um, now we're going to use our phonetic bite that we had here. And then we're going to put it and mount it. So I always write pH when I use phonetic and CR, obviously, when I do a CR bite. So when you, when you look at this, um, 
here's her anterior teeth. This is that little phonetic uh, 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 composite instrument was sticking right through there. And then there's the space that it generated here by, by that phonetic bite. Now, here's what's interesting when I, when I think about, well, is, is this a cranial or a dental problem when the patients come in in pain? So this, what I like about this one instrument is you can mark, now I mounted this one with the, with the face bow, but I put on here the marks for the MIP. So what you can do is you can lower this down and set it right on, that, on the uh, rail here and see where our hamular notches are. So here's our right hamular notch. And then here's our left hamular notch right there. So right there, it tells you the maxilla is pretty level. In other words, what you want to know, is it a, a cranial distortion or is this a dental distortion? And uh, what I like about this articulator, it kind of, it can show both and give you some information that might, it may or may not alter what you do, but uh, at least it's good information to have. So here she is on the HIP. And then there's the pin. What I like about this new platform here too, it's got a mirror on it. So you can actually see the pin up underneath the two teeth and see it right there that it's in the right sp spot. In the old days, it didn't have that mirror. I had to like drill a little hole in there to make sure that pin got in there. So she's got a, a, a little pitch forward. You can see the front teeth. The maxilla is a little pitched anterior. And you can see how this left side is higher than the right side. So she's got a little cant. Uh, I also put her on the aculiner. Sorry, the picture's a little on an angle, but pretty much shows the same thing. So this was my go-to instrument for a long time until I found this other articulator. I still use my aculiner quite a bit because it's, it's quick and easy to mount a case. So one of the other things we're looking at as we work up this, this diagnostic stuff, um, rather than just looking at the teeth mounting, we also want to look at our airway. Do you, is, are there any deviated septums? That inferior turbine is a little swollen there. I mean, there's, this isn't too bad. I sure see a lot worse in my practice, but any, any of these things, contrabolosis, nasal valve compromise, all this, you know, we, we can get a lot of help from the ear, nose, and throat doctors today. So here's Lois's phonetic bite now uh, with the, or her appliance with a CBCT now. And this is what I wanted to show everybody how this is what phonetic, the phonetic bite does. It, it puts the mandible, even though you might not think it moves very far when you say 66 or counting your S's, um, it, it moves the mandible. And I see this almost every time the condyle, condyle position improvement is, is uh, so predictable. And interesting side note is the airway was altered. And so we went from a 61 minimum space to a 241. That doesn't happen every time. I'm, I mean, I'm showing off here, but I realize that. But now that doesn't mean this doesn't collapse at night. So I'm not saying that, you know, if she had a breathing problem that this is gonna by itself gonna correct it. But I want everybody to, to know if, if I'm gonna make any mandibular position changes, I wanna change it for the better. And I wanna document that. So I wish I coined this. I've heard this back before. I gotta, you got to give Gelb credit for his, what he called the 4-7 position. And I, th I think that if I'm going to open vertical dimension and I'm going to have a patient with different types of craniofacial pain and, and jaw issues, muscle issues, I'm going to try and, and look for what can I do to put it in that kind of position. I believe that long term, that's going to be more stable. Uh, here's Lois's appliance right here. This is her daytime appliance. We're just inserting it. We're adjusting it. Um, I usually don't have much on the cusp here. I usually go first by back, but in the particular case, she's she's in dentistry too, so she wanted that right there. So we're playing with this appliance a little bit. But here's the appliance within full intercuspation, but look, look at the space. So so we're going to be in three months here. We're going to have this daytime orthotic 24 seven, but at night she's going to be in a Ferrar appliance because I don't want any posterior function back there while she's sleeping. And so we're going to hold her there and then wean her off this appliance and then do a remount or do MMI medical, um, medical improvement. So at, at this point right now, we haven't decided the final treatment plan because she's thinking through whether she wants to do any more ortho. 
she's already had it three times. These roots are very short uh, on these seven through 10. So she's a little afraid to do ortho and I don't blame her there. So we'll have that conversation, but it does bring up that slide about the fifth slide that we started with today is um, these teeth don't need veneers or anything or any restorative, but could we do ortho? Uh, we probably could do ortho on the whole case if she wants to to line these inc incisors up and then bring bring some uh, teeth down or these teeth are awful flat in the back. So I could do on lights filling in space on upper and lower, very conservative dentistry. So there's a lot of options here for her that, that we can fulfill and it's just a matter of what road she wants to do. Uh, here's John again. Um, this was John before I restored it. He came in and this is where I knew these teeth were too short and it's too beat up. We had to increase some vertical dimension here. And if I say nothing else, temporaries, temporaries, temporaries. And you got to leave them in for a period of time. These were in for a few months. And if you notice here, I build almost all my cases and I, and I learned this from David Hornbrook and I, I, uh, it's really been a blessing in that I, I build second by to second by and then second by to second by. I get my vertical, I get, I work out my incisal uh, guidance, I work out my, my function and my cuspid guidance and then I let it sit. Now you might say, well, what happens back here? You don't have any. What I like about this type of case is that I use what they call a molar bite back here and I can control. I have bite records that go between here that I save for the patient that I could put them back if God forbid they're in an accident or something. But but anyway, I can control that that distance back there. And, and it's a real easy way for the labs to restore to here. Now what's nice about it, then you then when you're ready, you build the upper second bite a second bite and let it set against the temporaries for a couple, three or four or six weeks. Then build the lower against that and then let this set. And I mean, we've seen patients with just bicuspids that do fabulous. And what I like about it is so easy to equilibrate three teeth here on the side and, and dial that in. And then, you know, any uh, kid out of dental school could restore these after that because you've already done all the work from here to here. This is where all the function is going to happen anywhere on these three teeth. So uh, I like I like this system. And then this is John fully restored. And here he is. And interesting enough on this case, John disappeared for a few years. And you can see how this is lower. I think on the later slides, you'll see the teeth actually erupted in. And so that wasn't the plan, but that's how it turned out. So, um, you know, and I'm just going to reinforce occlusion hasn't changed since the 70s I was in dental school. So we still want cuspid guidance. We want this to cross over and we want the anterior cross over here. We want posterior disclusion. Sometimes you may want the buys and have a light group function. I'm okay with that. The studies show do it with a second or first buy here. If you can avoid the second uh, buy and absolutely avoid the molars, you're going to get a lot more muscular uh, function. On the right side, do the same thing, cuspid guidance. I like them just barely passing like that and go on to anterior crossover. And you chew your food really good like this. Again, you got this gap. At any time, we can go back in there and prep these teeth, oh, crowns off and, and drop them down. If they were virgin teeth here, I'd probably just have an orthodontist just pull these into play. And there's protrusive, obviously nothing in the back. So I, you know, I think this is pretty ideal. There's one, there's one little thing. If anybody picked up on it, this is where you want to be careful right there. You don't want that lateral coming in protrusive or that's a chip waiting to happen. So here's John, uh, John again. And as you can see, this is a few years later and look at these teeth have already dropped down, which is a poor man's way of doing this, I guess. So how are we doing on time, uh, uh, Jordan? We are still looking good, sir. All right. So I just blast through a bunch of, a bunch of uh, slides there um, with uh, my reasoning for phonetic and how we build in temporaries. I, I didn't stop to, to say how I do that. Obviously, you could probably take every one of those steps and focus an hour on each one of those things. Uh, from the diagnostic records to the CBCTs to the 
how do you evaluate the models? Um, there was a lot there on uh, uh, cranial and uh, skeletal distortion. So um, uh, this is supposed to be a shotgun blast tonight. So uh, hopefully I've accomplished that goal. Um, do we want to answer a question now or you want me to just go, go to this one case that I have? Uh, we have a few questions, but if you can get to this case in about nine minutes, then we should I'll, be. All right, I'm going to rocket, rocket blast this. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mark is a, a good friend of mine and uh, approached me to rebuild him. Mark is, uh, he's my little brother. Um, so uh, this was his playing days. Uh, he was in uh, Phoenix or uh, uh, Phoenix and uh, Buffalo and San Diego. And so um, Mark's got a pretty small airway diagnosed with sleep apnea um, and doesn't show much teeth. Um, Interesting enough, uh, he takes me to the Cardinals. Uh, uh, they, have one, they have one game a year where they have all the old players, so I get to reminisce with all the old NFL players, so it's a blast. So, But I always say I'm his little brother. He ate all my food. So, so here's Mark. No teeth on the top. Pretty level. I won't go through all this, but the the gist is he's got a pretty he's a uh, uh, apneic, um, not going to do very well without his CPAP, and we know it. So he he's also was already in the Hearst and herps and hated that. Um, here's his teeth. Somebody made him a, 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 a daytime appliance, and this was to try out the vertical. However, that looks really extreme. So we cut this thing down and got closer to reality. Um, and we could probably talk about freeway space for a whole hour or two, but in, in this particular case, I use phonetics. I use 75 and, 50, uh, and 66. So 66 tells you the minimum speaking space and 75 the maximum speaking space. So I try to, try to keep that viable. Um, here's Mark, he's serious class three, and he's beat the snot out of these teeth, obviously. So, not fun. Pretty short teeth. He's done a lot of the incisal prepping for me already. Um, here's the lower teeth. So, like I said earlier, I like starting with aesthetics and I finish with function. So, I start playing with... Uh, composite on here and start saying where where should that incisal edge miss america pageant uh, a few years back what was it uh, the average uh, uh, lady in the pageant was 3.7 millimeters at repos that showed display of centrals uh, guys one or two is probably fine and so i do mock-up and so this is before we even wax it up because I don't want to just give them a, give the lab a model and say wax wax the case. I don't want them having that kind of control. So I start just doing a quick mock up. I didn't really like that mock up, so I went ahead and just did some composite bonding. So I started lengthening. I'm not worrying about width of teeth yet or anything. I'm just trying to I want I want to try to find this line. We know here we can bring it down a little bit farther and come up to the corner. And we know we got a tiny airway. And this is his problem. Mark is not going to do surgery. So we did it. We start with a phonetic bite. So even though we're going to build him and he's probably still going to be on CPAP, I still want to build him with the best, best airway possible. So we use Futar D with a phonetic bite. And, and even with that, he went from what, 32 to 83. So three, four times. So um, that in itself may not may not solve anything, but uh, it's better than where he was. And so here's his condyle position. He's actually got the, I kid, I kid him all the time, he's got the smallest condyles I've ever seen. So anyway, he's got some issues in his nose that we knew about. So um, I don't think he's still today has, has dealt with them yet. Um, put him on the aculiner, um, which uh, this is actually isn't his model but we're gonna switch here. There's his model. So we mark his HIP spots and we put him on, put him on the rail on the aculiner and there he is. So not, he's got a little cant on that right side and in the posterior back here. So there's his phonetic position. And interesting how close he is here and far away over here. And that's what we see very commonly. 
and here's this mock-up and then this this i use this mock-up to take an impression of and then i send this to the lab for the wax up so the local lab here wax this up on the aculiner and we're measuring remember i said somewhere between 15 and 20 here we're 19 here it looks like so we wax it up short of the teeth because we know we're going to add on make a putty of the wax up and which goes in the mouth. We first, this is a reverse step, but I, I etch the teeth first before I put that putty in with a bisacryl. And literally without bonding agent, this bonds to the teeth pretty much, it sticks to it. So this is still the mock-up and I work out everything right there in the mouth. Midline, smile, some occlusion, not much, because we don't have a lower plane here yet. And just, just as a review, we can decide this position, the facial part of a front tooth on the articulator. We can, we can decide the actual holding contact, number one here. But all the guidance, this, this is, has to do with the F position, the speech, and this is lip closure path here. And this, this thickness is real important for your S's back here. So, so I think starting to work this out early is very, very important. Back then I was using the Coist face bow and we transfer it on a panadent and we, we now have the wax up, mock up, transferred from the mouth to the articulator. So this is our, this is our guide now. And this is one of the most important photos for the lab right there. They want, um, we want them to see the eyes, we want them to see the clusal plane, the ears, and that this is perpendicular, that maxilla is perpendicular. It was done on the aculiner with the MIP position. Make a stent of the teeth, and then we got a guide to where we're going here. So what's nice about this mock-up on there, I'm, I'm prepping through my composite. And it gives you your, you do your depth gauge reductions. And I mean, I didn't take much off the teeth at all because he did all the work for me. I did this in different colors because you can control the occlusion by doing two, three preps at a time and taking your bite. You're using the rest of the mock-up to, for your occlusion. And then you've already, you've already duplicated the mock-up and all you got to do is just get your temps in there. So he's got to wear those for a few weeks, which he did. And then during that time, guess what we're doing on the bottom? We're, we're building up the occlusion with composite. So I could have prepped these. Um, I chose just to do composite. I'm, I, I like doing it that way. Maybe it takes a little bit more time. Some people don't like to do that. Um, but I, I, uh, I enjoy doing that, that procedure. We T-scan everything while he's in the temps. And then you got to control his airway. Uh, he was he was uh, queasy about the CPAP at the time. He didn't like it, so we tried using the Z Quiet. These work okay. They're not they're not uh, the cat's meow. We I've experimented. They get a little loose sometimes. I experimented putting denture soft line materials in it, and it seems to work pretty good. Um, I modified his herps, but it didn't work too well because these teeth just they don't fit anymore. So. So now you got temps against composites and I hold that for two or three months. And then we finally, we get the maxillary done. So then you can go to final on the, on the maxilla. So he was pretty happy after that, it was hard to get him back in. And so we're back. Now we're going to talk about the lower here. So we're going back with that phonetic bite and we're going to go back on the aculiner. And here's your bite record, same way. There's your wax up. And then we go first by to first by on this. So I'm building the occlusion on the side. I'm, I'm leaving the molar back here for control. So Mark was a combination. We This is a, a DDSO from a Diamond Lab. And um, Mark was uh, got him an APAP. And so between the, this appliance plus the APAP, he is a happy camper. Um, I think I just, I wanted to put this slide in, no matter what we do, even if they don't have apnea, 
you want to have some kind of appliance to control their nighttime. The proprioception at night is totally different than during the day. And I think for these cases for stability long term, I think we need something. And that in itself is another hour conversation uh, later on down the road. So Mark's Mark's uh, been in uh, completed now about uh, five, seven years, five, six years. And uh, in his CPAP every night and his appliance and loves it. Well, it looks great. So thank you. So, you know, the technology, I mean, you got to have access to a CBCT to, to look at some of the stuff. You need some decent articulators, um, whether you like SAM, whether you like Stratus, whether you like AccuLiner, uh, um, all, the, all the parts are there uh, that you can get nowadays and do any, any combination you want. Uh, mounting jigs for articulators are real important. You got you to gotta work with great labs, and I've been very fortunate with my laboratory. And as you can see there, I take a lot of photographs. So if you're going to do a bunch of photography like that, you got to have more time because it, it, it takes a lot of time to do the photography at the same time you're doing the case. And uh, so anyway, I always love this quote by Pete. You know, we dentists need a semi-adjustable articulator and a fully adjustable brain. And I, I've always laughed at that, but it, it's so true. It's, it's This is really a thinking sport. And... Uh, and you know, you know, we got to go out and we got to just listen to as many people as we can. There's there's so much knowledge base out there, and it's changing so fast. So, um, if you haven't gone to see any of those uh, speakers that I talked about in the beginning, uh, I would uh, make a point to go see some of them. So, uh, anyway, there is nothing here that I showed tonight that can't be done by every single dentist out there. This is this is not super hard work or anything. Um, um, I, I, you, you saw actually three different labs tonight. Um, and so different labs can do it. Uh, and you guys, I, you know, I just wouldn't fear the heights. I don't know why the orthodontists have more of a fear than we do. So that's actually where I got the title. But if anybody has any questions, feel free to email me on equipment or anything uh, at the Kevin MD, MD at Gmail. I'll be happy to help at any time. And, uh, um, I wish you guys all the best. Yeah. So Dr. Mueller, uh, we, <laughs> great picture right there. We actually have a few questions if, if you have a few minutes, um, yeah, so sure. you might have those at you. All right. So one of the questions that we have here is, so which position of condoil, uh, do you accept? Uh, basically, uh, which definition of CR do you recognize? Uh, because there's so many definitions. Goodness. There's like 16 definitions. Um, uh, what I write in my chart that I take a CR bite, that composite ball bite, I have the patients uh, uh, deprogrammed either with a TENS or with a laser or with an aqu aqualizer. I have the patient sitting up and then I have them count. Uh, I put the composite on the lower incisor and I have them count 61, 62, up through the 60s, even into the 70s sometimes. And then I have them open and I have them close onto that composite ball. And that's where I take my bite. That is what I put in my chart as CR. Now that's not by manipulated distally, but I believe that that is the best. Um, if you're gonna pick a closure pattern with a, with a bite and it has some, you know, the, the patients all bite different. There's the variable, how hard they bite on that composite ball has to do with consular seating up in the back. But I think I think with the posture, with them sitting up in the chair, where they're looking straight forward, I feel better about that bite than laying them down and by mani manipulating in the posterior. All right. Uh, I got the next one for you. Okay. So um, do you do you make your own daytime appliance or do you use a lab? Uh, both. Um, that one I made. The one that you saw today I made. So uh, do you have a preference or? Oh, I like the laboratory. I, I work with Diamond Lab. They make the best ones. Um, sometimes when I'm playing around with uh, uh, cases and things, I, I enjoy every once in a while making one myself. Um, that's actually a uh, printed material um that i played with we're in the process of getting a scanner so we're playing with materials right now hmm. okay 
And another question would be, how do you determine the amount vertically needed? Like, what is your protocol? And uh, what if the patient has a strong master, rigid muscles, or clenching slash bruising habits? How would that change the plan? Well, a lot of the clenching has to do with the breathing. And uh, my experience is if you get in the right mandib mandibular position, uh, some of that goes away. But the vertical is always uh, my first choice is how much material do I need to make this aesthetically and functionally correct? And that usually dictates how much open. The second thing that I'm always cautious of is not open too far where I change my overbite over jet too much because then you end up with ugly front teeth and or too thick and they don't like it. So um, uh, it all comes down to where that mandibular position is going to end up. If you're just doing if you if you, if you're just doing centric relation type mountings, um, you're going to have a lot more class twos. And you're going to have more base. Do um, more phonetic type bite. You're going to end up with more, uh, not so much over bite over jet, and that's what I found. But that's every case is different. And we got two more quick questions here. Um, so Dr. Hart is asking. How do you address cervical vertebrae issues? Uh, for example, Mark has a hypo, excuse me, hypolordotic cervical spine. C1, C2 positions may affect manual position. So how would you address the cervical vertebrae issues? Very much. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny you say that because I was trying to get Mark to the Cairo. We have, we have some cervical C1 Cairos available. We got some SOT Cairos. And um, so, I don't do any of that manipulation, but I try to encourage the patients to get to that. But uh, uh, that those when the patients that do go to those practitioners, they get they get some help with that. And lastly, uh, so do you do a face bow and an HIP mounting to know whether or not you have to do one over the other for final fabrication mounting? Um, I don't do both every time. I did it for a demo tonight. Um, but if I have to pick one and I can't decide, I'm going to, now that I have the new face bow, I'm going to use it, uh, and then do it with campers. Uh, most of the time you can do HIP. Um, I think, I think you, you'll, after a while, you'll see these patients and they're pretty obvious when one eye is high and one eye is low and, and, uh, you know, their face have different contortions, they, one ear sticking out and one's, you know. Uh, these cranial distortion patients, and, and they usually come in with a lot of different symptomology. And those are the ones you want to mount on with a face bow. You don't want to use HIP. But most of the time, I think you can, I mean, HIP can be your go-to majority of the time. And one more life question. Uh, so when do you, would you, I think you just answered this one, uh, but when do you use a face bow and when you prefer Koi D programmer? Uh, well, the face bow is to mount the upper the upper arch, uh, the model. Uh, the Koi deprogrammer, uh, if they're talking about the plastic piece that fits over the maxilla that has like a, mm. a, a Lucia jig on uh, attached to it, is that is that the question? I believe so. Yeah, uh, there's nothing wrong with the Koi deprogrammer. I almost put that in. I mean, there there there's probably another ten or fifteen ways you can deprogram, and there's about 20 other bite record techniques. And just for time's sake, I just threw the three or four that most most people are using. But I have nothing against a, a Koi uh, deprogrammer. I think it's great. All right. Well, I do have uh, some information I'll be emailing you from some of the attendees. Uh, so other than that, though, uh, I believe that's all we have time for. So Dr. Mueller, thank you so much for coming on and providing us with this uh, you know, informational, not only educational, but super um, relative uh, to what we have a lot of guys doing out there. Okay. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.